everything you said we already knew, more or less. Well, here's something that you didn't know. Two of those special atomic bombs haven't gone off. Good evening. When I was a student in Sydney, to mark our time there, a few friends of mine and I decided that we were going to bungee jump. So we paid our deposit and we climbed this mountain, this little hill in Woolloomooloo in Sydney, and there we were. As we were getting roped up, I saw the other people go off that cliff and I thought, you know, life is short, but I'm good, I'm young. So I didn't jump. Um, I don't know if it was the fact that it was this free fall or the fact that I was going to be suspended only to be yanked back up and then suspended again and never quite land. So there I was, chickened out. And on my way back to Sydney, into the city, my friend says, oh, it was weird that you didn't jump because I thought you would of all of us because you're the creative. What she really meant was I was a bit hippie and a little off-center. But research actually shows that people prefer skydiving over bungee jumping because in skydiving, you can just focus on the process of falling because you're strapped to a professional that will deal with the landing. So, it was interesting, apart from, you know, the offense I took of be being called a drama kid. Um, I thought about the relation between the thrill-seeking, impulsive nature of creatives. And I thought, is that really how creative is per creativity is perceived? This risk of just free-falling. And if that's the case, do we actually enable our students here to take creative risk? Creative risk or free-falling perceives itself as this. This, oh, you know what they say, when you trust technology, it's going to let you down. Right, free falling feels like this, right? This beautiful bliss where you're completely in control, yet totally surrendered to this artistic process of joy. But in reality, as you've seen, it feels a lot like this. Just fear, <laughs> straight up face planting. But that's because in our creative process, we're constantly worrying about sticking out our landing. And that's what a lot of education does to us. It tells us to kind of perfect that art of facing failure. But maybe because we perceive education as this, this beautiful, steady incline to knowledge, result, and application. We start at the bottom when we work our way up. And yeah, our legs get a workout, but we're going steadily upwards towards a goal. But the truth is, the process of learning is very different to the act of education. The process of learning feels like this. It's cyclical. There's ups and downs, and every success is coined with failure. And a lot of you are probably sitting here going, actually, you know, no, maths, psychology, science, all of that was a lot like this for me. Yep, I had a goal. I got my grade. That was awesome. But the truth is, learning goes outside of the four walls of education. When we look at learning as a suspended, lifelong act, we start to look like this guy. I'm just kidding. Um, Albert Einstein says that when you stop learning, you start dying. It's a little dramatic, but he looks like the kind of guy that his hair is intimidated by his wisdom. So I'm going to go with what he says. Learning is lifelong. It encompasses falls and dips and failure. What does that do? What does education do with that? Edgar Dale's cone of learning says that the first 30% of education is reading, listening, and speaking. And the fact is, you apply very little when you focus on that percentage. My upbringing was very much that top 30%. My teachers spoke at me, they got me to read books that I never understood, and they got me to speak, memorize, things that I didn't really understand. So I pursued dance, which is what I do here. I pursued dance for two reasons. One, I didn't really want to count past eight in life. That's a dance joke. You can laugh. Breaking barriers, people. Come on. The second thing is I was terrified of academics because I was labeled stupid. My teacher said to me, oh, if you just changed your habits, then you'd be OK. You know, you'd get along. But then they also said, you're never going to make it. So I moved to Australia to be a dance student. And it was great. I was getting on with curriculum. I was loving life. I was pointing my feet. It was great. And then it came time to write my first paper. Super simple, 1,500 words on the use of breath in movements. 
everything I believed about my education came back. I said, but I'm stupid, I didn't know we had to write exams. And so I handed my paper in, and for the first time actually, I related it to the material, because I learned it in class. I put my heart and soul into it, and I handed it in. And three weeks later, I got my result, and it was a D. And you know what, I'll take it. Because I come from a family where if you pass math, or pass anything, if you're, you know, me, your parents testify at church, like, she didn't fail, yes. And for Indians, that's very rare, so my parents were pretty great about that. When I got my paper, all I had was just satisfaction, because I hadn't failed. A few days later, I found out that distinction in Australia. Ah, I just ruined my punchline. That in Australia, D stands for distinction. So I didn't just pass my exam, I actually excelled in it. For the first time, my passion was validated academically. Similarly, a student of mine who loved dance but didn't quite take to math went to university and she did a course in photography. And for the first time, through aperture and focus and ratio, she learned maths. She didn't spend ages trying to solve problems, but she practically implemented the application of mathematics. How do I do this in my creative career here? Well, I use vocabulary every day. I was told very strictly not to do that. Sorry about that. <laughs> I use vocabulary every day to teach dance. Not dance just, you know, point your toes, stretch your feet, but quality, the quality of dance. So I use terms like sustain, release. When I say use, I really just mean yell because, you know, passion sometimes is yelling, it's a fine line. But I also use hippie terms like, you know, squeeze the orange and stretch your wings or whatever. So my kids kind of only take me seriously half, like 50% of the time. But I do use vocabulary and what that does is it takes my dance students from dancers to performers and expressive artists. Now, if I were to take that very principle and swap it around, what if I could teach vocabulary using movements? Now, I'm really dyslexic, and I'm not saying this like an audition to get onto X Factor, like, take me, I have a story that'll make you cry. I'm really dyslexic. Um, I can't quite understand processes that I read. I can't quite put words together when I say it and when I spell it, um, especially the word itinerary. <laughs> there you go, proof, right? Freaks me out. 28, can't say it, itinerary. So I use this application of movement in order for my brain to recognize the sound chunks or the syllables in them. So I go, itinerary, itinerary. I look like a freak 50% of the time, but hey, let your freak flag fly. But it's the use of imagination that helps me break barriers in terms of vocabulary and literacy. Imagination, Ken Robinson says that the the, the main component for all human achievement is imagination. We hold, again, sorry guys, <laughs> we hold, we hold the power of innovation. We are our best resource. So what happens to us when we focus on sticking out that landing? What is it that we're doing? We're stealing ourselves and robbing ourselves of authenticity. When we focus on sticking that landing and perfecting that fall, we don't actually end up being ourselves. Shame researcher Brene Brown says that authenticity is the daily, the daily practice of letting go of who we're supposed to be and simply trying to be who we are. When we're courageous enough to take creative risks, we need to be kind in the face of failures because it's that bottom bit of the circle of learning is where we grow the courage to jump again and then again. And with every circle, we develop the courage to speak, to make change, and to finally impact and give back to the community in whichever way we can. Because I know that why, when I eventually, no promises, l skydive, I don't want to tell the story of how I safely landed. I want to tell the story of how I courageously jumped off a plane. You've been great. I couldn't see you, but you've been great. Thank you so much. Have a great evening. <laughs>